Okay, so we're going to be looking at flows in networks, and we're just doing the AS section of this in Chapter 3. But if you are doing A2, I'd recommend just going straight through with Chapter 3 and then into Chapter 4 because they flow very nicely into each other. So in this chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to try and seek to model the way that things travel through what something that's called a capacitated directed network. That literally means it's a network that's like this and there is directions in it because it's directed and capacitated means that each of the different arcs or edges, I'm probably going to use both of those words in this, have got a maximum capacity that can flow through it. So what we can do with this is we can model things. Most commonly, we should think of it as like the flow of water through a network of pipes. And if the water exceeds a particular rate through a pipe, then we could say that that pipe would burst. So we, we couldn't possibly go through that. We could also do it about the flow of traffic along a network of roads. So these could be representing different roads that we have here. And this could be representing the maximum number of cars that could pass through the road per minute or per second, whatever it might be. We could talk about the flow of people along one-way corridors and the flow of data along computer networks. So there's lots of different kind of purposes for this. And it looks similar to things that we've done in decision one, but we're talking about the way that information or that things are flowing through this particular network that we have here. Now, the numbers, they represent the maximum amount that can flow through that arc, its capacity. So we've got capacity of 11, 9, 8, nothing greater can flow through that. The source vertex is where all the flow is starting. And in that case, we can clearly see that C is the source because we've got all of those things. All of those um, arcs are flowing out of it. And then the sink vertex is where all the flow is heading towards. And so you can see in this particular case, that E is the sink because all of the flow is going towards it. And when we get to chapter four, we can see where you might have two sinks or two sources, and we'll learn how to deal with that. But in uh, flows in networks one, which is the AS section, we will only ever have one sink and one source that we have here. So these are the parts that we're going to look through. This is just the introduction. We talk about cuts when you cut a network, which will make more sense later on. How to find an initial flow. In other words, what might be flowing through this diagram that we've got here. We then might want to do a flow augmenting route, which is trying to say, what's the maximum that we could actually have flowing through here? Because that's kind of what we want to know, right? Like how much water can we possibly flood through this system? Or, you know, how much, how many cars can we safely have traveling through here before we get traffic jams? And then last of all, we look at something called the max flow min cut theorem, uh, which should just make a lot of intuitive sense. And then we'll do some exam questions to finish off with. Now, I really like this chapter. I've enjoyed learning this one recently. Um, and I think you're going to enjoy this one too, because it's got a lot of intuitive kind of logic that goes with this. Which brings me on to flow logic. Now, we have two different conditions here. One is the feasibility condition, that the flow along each arc cannot exceed the arc's capacity. That makes sense, right? It's not possible to have something flowing along an arc that is bigger than the capacity that we already have there. And then the conservation condition also, also should make sense. The amount flowing into a vertex is equal to the amount flowing out of a vertex is equal to the amount flowing out of a vertex. And so that doesn't work in this one because we've got an eight here and then a five and a two. But this eight, five and two, they don't represent an actual flow. They represent the maximum that could flow through here. So eight could be flowing through here, but only five and two could be flowing through here, which means that actually eight is never going to be possible. The maximum this could be is going to have to be seven because it's not going to be able to travel through these bits. There'd be like a jam at that point. And that's what we mean about this conservation condition and this idea of there being flow logic. And we're going to use flow logic to find missing values and feasible flows. Feasible flows will be when we're actually saying, OK, how much could actually flow through this diagram? And then a little bit more about some terminology. An arc is saturated if the amount flowing through it is equal to its capacity. So, <coughs> pardon me, um, if you have this one's capacity is 20 and we actually do have 20 th flowing through it, we call that arc a saturated arc. The value of a flow is the amount of stuff flowing through the network. <coughs> Apologies. Um, it could be the total amount of liquid. It could be the amount of cars. It could be the amount of people that is flowing through the network. It's the total, total amount flowing out of the source. It's therefore also the total amount flowing into the sink because there has to be an equal amount coming out of the source and an equal amount coming in at the sink. 
So I have got this same diagram that was from the beginning one, where we had all of the capacities in the sort of non-circled numbers. And I've now added in, in these circled numbers, an initial flow pattern. This is actually just telling me how much is currently flowing through the arc. And this could be cars per second, volume of water per second, people per second, all sorts of things like that. And you can see here that this one is not running at capacity because it's 19 when its capacity is 20. And we're going to try and use some of our flow logic from the previous page to help us find out the values of X and Y for this first part. So let's have a look at x. Uh, where is x? x is over here. And we can see that the 5 and 2 are flowing out of d, which means that x must be 7. So I'm going to say this for my explanation. I will say flow into d must be equal to the flow out of d. The flow into d is x. The flow out of d, I'm looking at the circled numbers, is the 5 and the 2. So that must mean that x is equal to 7. And then for y that we've got here, we can now look, there's lots of different ways we could potentially do this. We could look at all of this flow into the sink, and we could see how much is flowing out of the source. So I'm going to say the flow out of the source is equal to the flow into the sink. So out of the source, remember we're looking at the circled numbers, it is an x, a 19, and a 4. So x, a 19, and a 4. And then flowing in to the sink, there's an 8, there's an 11, there's a 5, and there's a y. So what's that? x plus 23. Oh, x is 7, isn't it? So that is 30. And then we have 8 plus 11, that's 19, plus 5, that's 24, plus y which means that y is equal to 6. So I'm going to just jot that down. x is 7 and y is equal to 6. It then says to write down the five saturated arcs. So I'm just going to look for ones where the capacity matches the flow. So these ones do, these ones do, these ones do, these ones do, and these ones do. Those are all saturated. So I'm just going to write them down as their paired names. So we have arc AB, arc AE arc df, arc cf, and arc de are our saturated ones that we've got here. I wanted to also say for this one, instead of doing the flow out of the source and the flow into the sink, I could have had a look at what was going on with f, right? I could have also seen that I have a 4 and a 2 flowing into f, and then that must be a 6 that is flowing out because the flow into F must be the flow out. So I did it with source and sync. In the textbook, they do it with going in and out of F. So you can use this logic for any of the different vertices or the sinks and the sources. Now what we're going to do for part C, we're going to write down the value of the initial flow. Now the initial flow is actually just saying how much is flowing through the system. And we talked about it here. It is the total amount flowing out of the source or the total amount flowing into the sink. And actually we worked that out earlier on. It is just 30 that we did earlier on in the question. And then it says, what is the current flow along the route C, A, E? So we're going to go from C to A to E. Now there's 19 here and then 11 here. So when we talk about an entire route that we've got like this, we're going to say what's the, the biggest amount that could flow through that entire route, C, A, E. So it wouldn't be 19 because you couldn't fit that through the A, E. So with the 19 and the 11, we take the smaller value and we will just say that it is 11 for this particular point. So I want you to pause the video and have a go at using some of the logic that we've just talked about here and see if you can find the answers to these questions. And then you can try exercise 3A and I'll talk to you a bit about what I mean by question 5 and 6. So pause the video and come back and you see if you get the same thing as me. Okay, so for part A it says to state the saturated arc. There's only one saturated arc. Can I see it? Yep, it is ET for this one because there's an 8 and there's an 8 for this one that we've got. Okay, um, what's my part B? It says, find the missing values explaining your reasoning. So my missing values, I've got an X, a Y, and a Z. So it looks like I'm going to do one of them to do with A. Okay, so I will say the flow into A is equal to the flow out of A. Into A, we have 26. Make sure you're looking at the circled numbers. Out of A is 10, X, and 9. 
So that must mean that x is equal to 7. So I'm going to just drop that on the diagram in case that's useful. Now for y that we've got here, I'm going to look at b because we've got flow in and flow out. So I shall do the flow into b. There might be other ways of doing this. As long as you get the same value as me and you explain what you're doing is the flow out of b. So the flow into b is a 10 and a 9. And the flow out of b is a y and a 12. So that must mean that y is equal to 7. And I'm going to jot that down on the diagram as well. And I'm just going to do the last one, which is my z. I'm probably just going to look at d for this. OK, so I'm going to say for z, the flow into d is the flow out of d. So into d, there is a 7, a 7, and a 4. And out of d is the z. So that means that z is 18. OK, so we've done a and b. Let's see if I can squeeze all of these questions in. It says state the value of the initial flow. Well, that's just the 26 plus the 10. So that's 36. Write down the current flow along B, E, D. So here's B, here's E, here's D. We have the 12 and the 4. We obviously take the smaller one, which is 4 for that one that we've got. And what's my last one? I'm going to write the current flow along S, A, B, E, T. I'm going to highlight this to make it easier. S, A, B, E, T. So there's a 26, a 9, a 12, and an 8. That means it's going to be 8 because that's the smallest of those ones that we have got along there. OK, so you can now try these questions from exercise 3A. If you want to for question 5 and 6, you can leave them until you've done some learning about how to actually do an initial flow pattern or you can do kind of trial and error. Um, but at this stage, we're not really expected to know how to do an initial flow pattern, but they ask about it in question 5 and 6. So if you want to play around with it, you can just do it with some trial and error. I'll see you in the next video when we talk about making cuts and finding the capacity of a cut.